Uh, my name is Mark Stevens. I'm managing partner of Enable Health, and we're thrilled to be here uh, bringing some um, wit and wisdom, we hope, from the United States to Dublin. Um, we're very grateful for Martin and his exceptional team and excited to be part of the Dublin Longevity Summit. Um, Enable Health, what brought us here, um, my background includes running a statewide a nonprofit organization. Of course, we have a different healthcare model in the United States where we blend commercial payers with uh, oftentimes nonprofit health systems uh, with a government uh, CMS organization, Health and Human Services, uh, providing uh, federal regulations. But what we try to do uh, is take advantage of, uh, I would say, an agile system that focuses on the commercial aspects of innovation. So you'll see, hopefully, uh, a number of, of, um, of points about healthcare and innovation being advanced through a, a commercial sector uh, that's vibrant and agile. Um, that's what we like to think of as, a, as the positive side of our system. There are some uh, negative aspects as well. So we're really excited about providing some perspective that we hope um, will open up uh, a window into how both our system works and how it could benefit um, from learning from your healthcare system. Um, what we'll do that, uh, how we'll do that is, uh, as Martin reflected in as you'll see in your agenda, we have a number of different experts in this first panel that we'll talk about uh, subjectively uh, pain management, uh, innovations in pain management, and obviously their uh, ramifications on longevity. When we talk about longevity, we talk about health and wellness as well. So um, in the United States, uh, for instance, there's a, a movement that's been afoot um, called value-based care, where we try to move away from um, fee for service and uh, reward um, uh, participants in the healthcare system as physicians uh, through their uh, metrics around outcomes, rather than just, uh, if you would, um, throwing a service um, once you're sick or approaching healthcare as a sick care system. Um, one of the organizations most involved with shepherding uh, how we transition to a, a new paradigm of care and how we take advantage of uh, the strength and innovation that we have as a system is the American Medical Association. And we're very fortunate uh, uh, to have uh, among our speakers, not only in this panel, but throughout the conference, uh, Dr. Michael Zuck. Uh, Michael will be leading this panel discussion looking at pain management, um, but we'll also ask Michael to talk about some broader themes uh, in healthcare and then tie them all together as it relates to longevity. Um, Dr. Zuck, um, who will be joining me in just a moment. He has some slides, but we're gonna chat a little bit so you can get an idea of who he is as a person and, and his roles throughout the system. I'm fortunate to call him an advisor, a colleague, and a friend. We've worked together a number of years. Uh, Mike uh, holds five advanced degrees, a few more than me. Um, Mike also founded and runs uh, Geisinger Health Systems, one of the most prestigious health systems in the country, their MSK, or Musculoskeletal Institute. Um, and as I mentioned, he's the, um, um, the uh, chair-elect of the American Medical Association. So it's a great time to talk to Mike because uh, he's not the chair yet. Uh, there's still an agenda for you to write for next year. Uh, so I encourage you, he's a, you'll find him very approachable um, with some wonderful wit and wisdom and insights, um, but you'll also have a chance perhaps to even influence American healthcare for next year if you have a chance to talk with him. Um, so without further ado, I'd like to bring Michael up. Again, we're gonna chat a little bit. Mike has some slides to share. And then we have two other healthcare leaders, uh, Abby Bischoff and Deborah Dullin, who will talk about their own perspectives on pain management and healthcare. So thank you for joining us. Um, sit tight, we'll have fun with some slides and conversation. If we have time, we'll open it up uh, at the end for a brief Q&A with the audience as well. Thanks, Mark. Thanks for the uh, invitation, Martin. Thank you for the uh, kind invitation to this particular conference in Dublin. You know, prior to the uh, work that I do at uh, AMA, uh, I've been there uh, many, many decades, but also in the leadership for the past five years or so. Uh, this was actually on my radar before all of that. And so serendipitously, we get to talk a little bit about some of the work we do at the AMA, but uh, in my day job, I'm actually, as you know, an orthopedic surgeon, uh, and I have a great interest in both longevity, 
uh, uh, the health span and the role of pain. And so we're going to talk a little bit about that, uh, more on the professional side, but I know you wanted to ask, uh, talk a little bit about some other stuff. Yeah, well, I, you know, so a little bit more uh, about how Mike and I got to know each other. Um, and, and the word innovation you'll find pops up a lot when you talk with Mike, um, because um, I think what you'll find with all the speakers uh, that we have today is, a, is an interest in, in solving problems. And um, Mike, you know, having worked with you, um, I, I've been fascinated by your interest in innovation and specifically your interest in early stage companies and how those breakout technologies and, and, their, and the entrepreneurs who create them uh, have the potential to transform our healthcare system. And with orthopedics, you've got a really powerful juncture between the clinical and, and pain management. Um, and you know what we do at Enable Health is we specialize in working with early stage companies and helping them commercialize. At the same time, we work with health systems, helping them innovate. Often we help them innovate by introducing them to early stage companies. Um, so Mike, maybe you could talk a little bit about um, how that plays a role, innovation and, and early stage companies and entrepreneurs and what you look to accomplish in orthopedics and ultimately with longevity. Yeah, I think, uh, you know, it's interesting that, you know, some of the most fascinating people in the world are those who are innovators and entrepreneurs, right? Because innovators on the one hand have great ideas, entrepreneurs take those ideas and bring it to market. But when you find an innovator entrepreneur, then you actually find something and somebody who's got a really special talent. And I think in the world of, uh, you know, the subject matter for this conference, in the world of longevity or lifespan versus health span and things like that, I think um, what I see most often happening right now is a combination of ideas, science that exists but needs a venue, uh, and, and science that exists that needs uh, advocates uh, to be able to uh, promote. Um, I think there's, uh, you know, the world of health and wellness is such a multifactorial uh, area uh, that uh, some of the key innovations are going to be how we bring these ideas together, uh, draw science behind it, and then have outcomes impact that we can follow. You had mentioned value-based care uh, earlier uh, within the scope of American medicine. And this is the idea of trying to prevent chronic disease from becoming an acute problem. Uh, or uh, trying to uh, alleviate the burden of uh, acute issues prior to them happening. And that's all in the world of uh, health and wellness. Uh, and so it's very exciting to not only be here, but also, as you say, uh, interact with a lot of people who are involved. And one thing that people may or may not know, but the American Medical Association has a uh, innovation arm uh, where we seek these types of opportunities. It's a company called Health 2047. Uh, and we look for those ideas that are driven by physicians and those who are in the frontline marketplace uh, to drive innovation in these great uh, clinical areas. You know, one, um, one thing I didn't mention in Mike's background, there's a lot. <laughs> so I'd encourage you, if you go to the American Medical Association website to look up Dr. Zook, it's, uh, it's humbling to, to see all that you do. But one, one aspect of his career, he was a White House fellow. And um, I'm going to, it was interesting, I was, yesterday I was walking around uh, your lovely city, and I thought, well, to get some inspiration on, on today's event, uh, I could do it through a pint of Guinness, uh, which I did. Um, but more to the point, we went to the Temple Bar, and, and, uh, and I was reading up on James Joyce, and I was, you know, obviously fascinated, as we all are, and I was familiar with his work, and I thought I'd get some pearls of wisdom from James in a chair, and I didn't. I thought it was a little too, little too dark, a little too heavy, but on my way back to the um, Hilton Dublin, I passed by a house that George Bernard Shaw had lived in, and um, for the past couple of years, I've had as a, in my footer of my emails a quote from him. And, and George says, and I think it's important and relevant here, we don't stop playing because we get old. We get old because we stop playing. And Mike, when you were a White House fellow, you talked about the importance of unstructured play, of, right. of outside activities. Can you tell us about that? The, we, have a, we oftentimes, it's, it's referred to as a sick care system, um, not a health care system in the US. So what role does health and wellness play and things like unstructured play? Yeah, I think uh, you're, you're referring to a time that's not a couple decades ago, but it still <laughs> uh, is with me. Uh, so as you mentioned, I had the opportunity to work in, uh, in, uh, in the Bush, uh, George W. Bush uh, administration as part of his larger White House Fellows Program. And my assignment happened to be at the US Department of the Interior. For those of you who are not familiar with the United States, that's really the parks and the lands and the forests and things like that. And so what I was able to begin and initiate at that point is something that actually your brains are very uh, facile 
grapple with now is it's the idea that outside nature has a role in your natural, in your health. Uh, and amongst uh, some of those uh, aspects of not only just being outside, but it's the idea of being outside and not really having an agenda to do anything. And so this is this idea of unstructured play, which we know now through many decades of evidence has a significant role uh, in playing uh, a positive influence on your quality of life. Uh, and I think all of those things, again, as I related to before, I think need to be brought into the larger scientific discussion as well. Uh, and we're seeing that more and more where there are now peer-reviewed journals that talk about aspects of things that we used to say are just soft science. Uh, but now actually has a very important role in this larger picture uh, of how people live uh, not only longer in terms of time span, but also a uh, better quality of life. Mm -hmm. yeah. and, and one final point on that, I know we worked on some initiatives during uh, COVID uh, that focused on esports and connecting with, a, with a, an environment where it's very difficult to get out and socialize, opportunities particularly for seniors through esports to maintain um, a sense of community. And, uh, and connection. Yeah. Anything about esports? Yeah, you know, the esports community is, a, is the, for me personally, one of the strangest phenomena that I ever saw, right? It's uh, this uh, emergence of the esport athlete uh, that is, uh, you know, heretofore we thought was somebody who was at age 45 living in their mom's basement uh, playing video games. Now this is an entire athletic competition, which is actually very interesting. Uh, and from an orthopedic perspective, it's, it's pretty interesting that we're seeing a tremendous number of chronic musculoskeletal diseases coming out of this. So you see carpal tunnel, you see back posture problems, and it's to, to the point where many of these esports teams are now having their own physical therapists, they're having their own athletic trainers, and I'll tell you, it's a, it's a fantastic way, I think, to, uh, to be able to disengage, uh, potentially, uh, and uh, participate in athletic sport that we hadn't really thought about before. Yeah. Before you start your slides, yeah. let me say one word, and I'd like to see your reaction. Uh, pickleball. Yeah, so pickleball is, raise your hand, I can't see anybody. Anybody play pickleball in here? Okay, just a handful. You know, this is the fastest rising sport in, uh, in certainly in the United States, I think maybe globally. Mm -hmm. Started by a family in Colorado, I believe. They just decided in their backyard to draw a little court and play with a little plastic wiffle ball. Uh, but it is the number one rising, uh, fastest growing sport in the United States. It's also the number one uh, rising cause of musculoskeletal injury <laughs> in the United States. So for an orthopedic surgeon, this is an at interesting age, phenomenon. At all age groups. At all age groups. Uh, and it's a great way to stay, I think, active and healthy. Excellent. Well, thank you, Dr. Zuck. Now, I guess we have a slide presentation. So. Yeah. Um, let's see, I'll get up here. Okay. And following Mike's slide presentation, we'll invite Deborah Dolan to join us. Oh, sure. So I wanted to switch gears a little bit, and this was the original invitation to come and talk a little bit about what I do on a professional basis. And this is a talk that I had given, or at least a topic that I've been interested in for many, many years. It's about the issue of turning the pain curve. Uh, is it possible that we can move into a painless or a pain-free future? Uh, and what does that look like? And I just want to draw a few things that we're working on, a few things that are happening on the horizon uh, that could be related to this. So when you look across the lifespan, uh, it's an interesting thing. We talk about quality of life. We talk about the defeat of chronic disease. We talk about this idea of uh, compression of morbidity. And this idea of compression of morbidity is that uh, James Fries at, uh, at Stanford University proposed a theory which basically said the end of life, right, at the beginning of the end of life is compressed into the last couple years of life. And that's usually triggered by some exacerbation of chronic disease. But as we think about even that theory, which was proposed probably a couple decades ago now, none of that, even though it was objectively identified as a trigger point that led to the last X, Y, X, you know, two, three, four, five years of life, None of it incorporated any sort of quality of life metrics such as the experience of pain and whether that should be a part, uh, partially in the discussion about when the trigger of this compression that occurs at the end should be considered. Chronic pain, as you know, is a tremendous personal, economic, social, socioeconomic uh, impact, and it's really, really difficult to treat. I think that, as you know, as, as patients get older, uh, if they experience pain uh, and they live with a life of severe pain, they actually, it turns out, they don't actually lose life because of pain. So if you look at the statistics that are out there, pain is only moderately associated with the qu quantity of life. But unfortunately, it's more substantially uh, associated with the quality of life. So you could have a life living in severe pain, but compared to your peers who are in less severe pain, you don't live less in terms of how many, how many years. You just live worse. And so this is one of the things that I think is one of, uh, that must be addressed in this world of health and wellness and what we do in terms of uh, the world of longevity. Um, 
just to cover a couple things that are, uh, are, are uh, important to categorize what is types of pain, and this is in the world of musculoskeletal pain, there's really three types of pain to be able to look at and to think about when you think about pain. Nociceptive pain is the type of thing that you feel when you break a bone. Neuropathic pain is a type of thing like a chronic uh, back pain or something that goes down your leg or carpal tunnel. And nociplastic pain is a slightly different uh, set of pain that inc includes a number of different social factors that can be uh, addressed that exacerbate the world of pain or the experience of pain. Things like mood, depression, uh, and attitude, right? And so if you look at pain itself, if we're looking toward a world of, pain uh, of a pain-free life, we need to break it down to categories that we can fix or we can identify and try to address. Our, con our conventional treatments for pain are really fairly simple, even in 2023. We use conventional medications, right? We use pills, uh, we use injections, we use medications that, numb, uh, that dull the nerves. We have alternative methods such as TENS units or electrical stimulation that can uh, trigger a, a nerve ending to, uh, to desensitize it. Uh, we can use things like acupuncture, psychotherapy, uh, and sometimes now we're actually mixing medications together and using it topically to eliminate or de decrease the sensation of pain. Now there are some unconventional areas where we're beginning to investigate today too, this world of CBD, uh, the world of psilocybin, right? Early, early uh, studies that are starting to show this has an impact in terms of our perception of pain, and there are things then on the frontier. What do we look forward in terms of the world of, pain, of a pain-free life? Things like virtual reality, uh, cryoanalgesia, freezing nerves, uh, or even neuromodulation, modulating nerves on a regular basis rather than a single injection. And when you think about um, some other aspects that are coming down the pike. It's this idea of screening and protect, uh, prediction. How do we know somebody is going to be more susceptible to pain than, than the other person? Are there ways to be able to predict this through some of our blood tests or DNA? And what we're finding is that in the world of precision medicine, we're actually identifying certain nerve, uh, neur neuroreceptors uh, with our present in each individual human that tell us whether or not they have a higher propensity to perceive pain or not. And so, for example, in this, if you have CYP2D6 and you're a genotype, if you're one end or the other, one variant or the other, it has a predictive effect on as to whether or not you're going to be experience pain uh, greater than the person who doesn't. So it's an interesting precision medicine world where we're now beginning to identify certain receptors within human body to then precision, use precision medicine in order to help modulate. Then we're actually looking in the world of DNA, and we're actually finding some aspects of uh, different genomes or different, different markers within the gene that tell us, again, whether or not sensitivity is possible or whether or not the certain sodium channels are, are more active than others in, in other people. And so imagine a day when we can actually take your blood test, uh, send it for genetic screening, and we can tell you that in the future, 10 years from now, because you have SCN9A, right, that you will be more likely to experience pain in the decades coming uh, should you have a chronic in, uh, in, acute injury or a chronic uh, insult. It helps us give us some sense of whether patients, individual patients, can be treated, uh, treated in a much more personal way. We talked a little bit about managing pain, uh, and we know that there are multimodal uh, therapies that exist today which represent our current state of the art in the 21st century. This is where we combine things like local and regional anesthesia, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, gabapentin, a number of different drugs that when in combination are used can actually dull the senses to the point you can perceive less pain, but it doesn't affect everybody uniformly, and that's largely because of some of the research we're doing and understanding about the genetic markers and also also the receptors are individual uh, to a patient. We've certainly moved in the last five to 10 years away from opioids, as we know, which are significantly addictive, but we also know that they played an important role. But, we, uh, but during those, uh, the time period that we were studying opioids, we also know that some people were far more susceptible uh, to becoming opioid addicted than those who weren't. And again, those are genetic markers that we can identify today. What we're at, I think, in right now is the event horizon, and if event horizon for those astrophysicists out here is at the point of no return when you approach a black hole, right? At some point, at either you're either going to go into the black hole or you can escape. And I think in the world of escape from a black hole, and, and we call a black hole this world of pain, what are, what are we about to start getting into? Well, first of all, I think there are new modalities and applications that have just started to come out. We're starting to look at new injectables that actually last a long time, not 24 hours, but we're talking about three months, 
at a time. We're talking about different uh, modalities like, bur uh, like freezing nerves, not, not permanently, but only temporarily. And doing it in a way, we're using ultrasound to identify a specific nerve that may be causing pain. We're also looking at different ways of neuromodulation, where you can actually put an indwelling catheter in a patient who's had specific types of pain, and during a period of six months or a year, you can continue to modulate the dosage on a, on a very small basis to be able to modulate the pain on a regular basis. So then we talk about what's coming next and how does technology play a role in this? This is where I call into the metaverse, right? So there are companies out there right now who are using the world of virtual reality or augmented reality to help us understand and trick the brain into understanding that it's in a different uh, sensory environment than not. And so it's called distraction therapy, right? So what we've done in a number of different studies, including in our own institution, is when we take patients who undergo total knee uh, surgery, we're putting patients with an immediate, immediately after surgery into the metaverse. They get a set of goggles as soon as they woke up. And in the set of goggles, they have certain instructions to, to address their breathing, to address their understanding of their pain, and to watch something that would distract them from what they were feeling. And I'll show you some of those results. So this virtual reality issue isn't new. It certainly has existed for, since 1957, but it wasn't until 2001 or so that we really began to apply this in the clinical and medical setting. And it wasn't until 2020 where we actually began to do clinical studies that, uh, to demonstrate the effect efficacy. How do we know it works? Well, we know subjectively when patients come in and say, I feel better after having undergone that uh, experience. We also know from MRI studies that it actually works. And here you can see an actual MRI, uh, which demonstrates the effect in the, in the areas which, uh, sense, uh, that, that's, that feel pain. And you can see the increased activity with virtual, activity, uh, virtual reality with, uh, versus those without. And so what are our results? So at Cedar sinai uh, Hospital in Los Angeles and at Geisinger at my own institution, we saw 52% reduction in patient pain levels, 72% improvement in quality of life, self-reported quality of life, just from putting on a, pic, a, a pair of goggles and some of the things they're doing. So this represents, I think, a very interesting novel way to think about how we address pain in the future and the ultimate impact it has on our health and wellness. In other studies, 40% reduction of pain, 72% uh, reduction in behavioral health impairments, 300% increased participation in physical and social activities, and 115% uh, uh, improvement in their sleep architecture, which, as you know, has a very large impact on the overall aspect of health and wellness. So the question for us today is going to be, is pain-free in our future? Uh, is, is it through the world of precision medicine, multimodal treatments that we talk about, which is current state of the art? What are our novel extensions of our current modalities? And ultimately, what are the breakthrough technologies? And how do we apply them to the degree that we can become pain-free in the future? And then ultimately, in the context of this con uh, conference, how does a potential pain-free future affect our ability to not only increase the quantity of life, but potentially increase the quality of life. And these are the questions that I hope uh, we'll be able to talk about a little bit uh, in the panel coming up. And so to that point, what I'd like to do is I'd like to introduce our two other speakers who are coming up. I'd like to introduce uh, Deb Dolan. Where's Deb? Uh, if Deb can come. Deb is the CEO of a company called BioTrace, which has got a very, very interesting novel uh, uh, and I think very unique way of detecting whether or not a patient is actually in pain. For me, after having met Deb uh, a while ago, uh, it is the first, uh, in my mind, the first objective measure of pain. So when a person says, I'm in pain, right? You can actually put a number on it and see whether they're really pain. Think about the effect that it has potential on patients who are non-communicative or potentially demented or already in, on different medications. So we'll talk to Deb a little bit about that. And then I have Evelyn Bischoff. Where's Evie uh, Bischoff? She's uh, coming up. Very fascinating uh, uh, history, career history as well. She's an uh, internist and oncologist by training, has dual appointments working both in Europe and currently lives in Shanghai. She traveled 36 hours, I think, to get here today. Uh, she looks remarkably good. I think she slept for 24 hours uh, when she got here. Uh, but uh, also has uh, multiple appointments in the world of oncology, internal medicine, and uh, in longevity medicine. So fairly, very unique in her particular field. And so to kick us off, Deb, I think you had a brief talk that you wanted to give, or? I'll just uh, share a couple of slides sure. so people understand what the heck we're talking about. All right, about. let's go ahead and start <laughs> with that. Yeah. Good morning, everybody. Let's see. Can you hear me? 
Um, so I'm really grateful to be here and uh, be able to work with all of you that have been uh, driving longevity and the longevity medicine. Uh, I see that as an opportunity. Uh, uh, Eva, is it Evie or is that the best way to say your name? Yeah. Um, we were discussing earlier uh, our, our similarities and in our interests and, and one of the things that as I was thinking about um, your particular specialty is a couple of key words that I think resonate with what we do in pain and what you're doing with longevity, which is precision and prevention and individual care. And, um, you know, from a pain perspective, there's a quote up there, you might have read it by the time I've been chatting here for a couple of seconds, um, but it, it does say that the science of pain is actually quite complex. Um, and I know that longevity as well is quite complex um, in the study of that and the, the treatment um, that leads to longevity. Um, and there are a lot of biases that can be had with uh, um, the treatment and also health equity uh, if we're not looking at objective measures. So um, that's where the system that we've developed as pain trace has come into play. Um, I don't have a slide on the specific mechanism, but what we look at is afferent and efferent signaling. Um, but per in particular, we're looking at brain activity um, within the amygdala. Um, and that allows us to uh, take an individual's experience of pain. Um, I like to rip off somebody else's story when I discuss pain. Um, and it's uh, uh, Dr. Mosley, who is a neuroscientist. Uh, and the way he describes pain is related to his experience of, I was walking in the bush one day, and I felt something on the inside of my right leg. And I looked down, and it was a brown snake. And then he goes on to describe that um, that sensation, which he initially thought was a twig, is running up through his afferent signaling to his brain. The cortex is giving him perception, which is combined with his memory. And that then is going to be integrating to give him a where and what and has this happened before. The next part is, is that the cortex is going to communicate with the amygdala. And on the left-hand side of the amygdala is your affective state, which is going to be your emotion. It can be fear, it can be anxiety, it can be happiness, um, excitement, but affective. And your emotion plays a very large role in your pain experience. So we've got contextualization, and we've got memory, and now we've got emotion cortex and left amygdala. And on the right-hand side of the amygdala is the threat center. And you could refer to that as pain. So ultimately, pain is biological, psychological, and social because the contextualization of the mental aspect of your pain is the social part. It's what you've learned over the years. And as I look at how people respond um, to not only pain, but then if you think about longevity and some of the studies that came out of Harvard uh, where uh, we followed people for 80 years and we were able to see that they um, had improvement in their longevity, but most of that was related to relationships, positive relationships in their life. That was the big factor. Or the other one about ice cream <laughs> and lowering your risk of heart disease. And uh, nobody wanted to talk about it. Um, but what does that mean? Does it mean that something that makes you happy could actually give you a lowered risk of a disease state? Because when they compared that to low-fat dairy products, it was a 2.5 decrease in propensity for heart disease. But when they compared that to regular milk, ice cream beat out milk every day, a full-fat milk. So. What we do is when I talk about neural signaling, afferent, efferent, we end up with something that looks pretty simple. Um, the baselines, which you see are the flat lines there, um, and I, I don't know that this has a pointer, so I'm going to not point. Um, the baselines are chronic pain. And the more negative that baseline is, the more chronic pain. So we've worked with thousands of patients, and we know that um, a child, if I flip that, Positive means a state of non-pain. So a human child may um, be somewhere around a 10, they could be a 12, 
positive. Um, and then as we age, depending on how we're aging, uh, that number will become less and less positive until we finally flip into the negatives. So somebody that's gray-haired like me, and my picture is originally brunette. I've, I think I've been gray for a little while. I just used to dye it. Um, but I'm a, a plus one. I've had Lyme disease. Um, and I have joint pain every once in a while. Sometimes I'm a negative one. Uh, but I've also broken my leg and been a minus 15, not acutely breaking that fracture. Uh, we've also worked with surgical patients, and we see that they, with um, maybe more chronic diseases, could be minus 50s. So just to give you the range on these numbers. And if you look and you see those little peaks there, those are acute pain. And what those are is their amplitude changes. So a smaller amplitude would be a mild um, response to pain. Um, moderate is a orange and a red is a more severe. But they're not just orange uh, and red. They're numbers and they're correlated with human self-report for people that don't necessarily have effective state um, or psychosocial determinants that would change their self-report. So when you look at this, uh, you can look at squiggly lines all day. Um, it is correlated with activity. But you can see the blue there, that kind of turquoise, that's a minus 6 baseline. This is an osteoarthritis patient. Um, and then if you look at the words there, you'll see that the right shoulder extension is red. Um, we're not putting a lot of numbers to this yet, but that's a minus 8. Um, so it's an acute pain response. So we have a chronic baseline or a chronic pain of minus 6. We have a right shoulder extension of a minus 8. So it's a severe pain response and acute pain. And then that yellow over there, they're just there to draw your attention to it because these are actually live. I'm showing you stagnant versions. Uh, that's that's a minus one on that left shoulder flexion. Um, and then if we just do pre and post, and so these are NSAIDs. I'm going to use gold standard um, of care just for some of these slides, and I'm going to move quickly. Um, but the bottom one is the pretreatment. Uh, we'd start out non-painful at about a plus eight. You can see that there's a negative slope to that trace. There's a lot of information that's taken out of these slides. Um, every joint from head to toe is being flexed and extended. Uh, so we're moving from a plus 10 to about a minus 20 in the time frame of 10 minutes in a polyarthritic. Um, Post-treatment, two weeks out. Um, we're, we're around that plus 20. Left shoulder is the big acute pain response there. It's a minus 10. It's zero after two weeks. It's a high responder to NSAIDs. Um, knee pain, pre and post cortisone. Um, minus 2.2, moving to a minus 0.9. That's in about a 10 minute span. Um, and this is a person that's uh, had pre-injection. Uh, this is not the first cortisone injection. Uh, simultaneously have a comorbidity of hip pain, uh, starting out around a minus 6, moving to about a minus 1.3. Um, NSAIDs over 18 weeks. Um, on average, moving from a minus six for the first uh, couple of uh, measurements. These are snapshots um, over multiple dates, um, usually every week or two weeks. Uh, and then you'll see that from April 1st through July 21st, the average is a plus three. So we're moving from about a minus six to a plus three in our delta. And you'll see the green. That's all non-painful. It's all positive values. Um, but it's variable. Um, and that's true to anybody that's experienced pain. Good days, bad days. Mornings may be better than evenings. Uh, depends on if you take a walk, if you feel better after a walk. Um, and then as soon as the um, NSAIDs are um, cut off, uh, a couple of months later, we're seeing a return to negative. Um, monoclonal antibodies. Um, so I know we use a lot of biomarkers. Um, monoclonal antibodies are really rather interesting, especially related to some studies in rodent models. Um, so uh, the current anti-NGF MABs um, ultimately roll up to the brain and they modulate CGRP. It's a calcium gene-related uh, peptide. Uh, the CGRP studies, um, if you go to an IASP conference, uh, the International Association for Study of Pain, you'll see it only as active in the right um, hand side of the amygdala, which if we flash back to what I started with, uh, the right hand side of the amygdala is the part of the brain that's the threat or pain center. So CGRP is also really interesting when you look at longevity. 
because in preparation, because I don't talk about longevity all the time, I did look up some studies. Um, and there was a study done in rodents. Um, there's also some other some studies done with lower back pain patients and correlating pain with longevity. In women in particular, um, they found that there was a direct correlation with back pain and a decrease in lifespan. In these rodent studies, they were studying uh, TRPV1 knockout uh, rodents, which TRPV1 is part of the pathway mechanism that modulates CGRP. And um, CGRP can um, actually have activity not only in the brain, but it also acts in the peripheral. Um, it does work in the islets of Langerhorn, and it does decrease um, insulin or decreases insulin re resistance. Um, and they found that that um, had a very direct effect on um, the lifespan of these rodents. It increased the lifespan by 15%. There was a larger effect in the female rodents, interestingly enough, because usually things are more male <laughs> um, positive for a lot of these studies. So I was like, as being a female, I was like, woohoo, um, go, go females. Uh, for we once, we, something worked for us. Um, but additionally, I think the, the other aspect of that is not only did it increase lifespan, um, but it also uh, showed that the mice into age, into old age for the mice, um, had um, improved or maintained uh, metabolic rates. Um, which is interesting from a longevity perspective as well. Um, and this is just looking at, hey, on the right, uh, chronic pain improved over a five-month period being mapped out by pain trace um, with these monoclonal antibodies. Good days, bad days, the, the gray on the left, which is the acute pain averages, um, that plus 35 there is, uh, these are monoclonal antibodies and they fall off receptors rather quickly if they have a 30-day injection period. If you go five days beyond that 30-day injection period, you'll see that the acute pain is coming back. You'll also see that gray line, that the chronic pain uh, is coming back as well. Um, but the acute pain is a mad comeback um, when those monoclonal antibodies fall off their receptors. Um, I couldn't resist about putting this last one in. Uh, this is a bovine study that's been done over multiple years. A lot of the uh, data that I just showed you was all human. Um, but this is done from 21, 22, and 2023. This is a uh, industry uh, specific group that we're working with and what they started out with was uh, monitoring um, uh, these uh, group of uh, bovine uh, uh, patients and remember more negative is more painful. Um, so they started out as a minus 4.7 in 2021. And then between 2021 and 2022, they introduced individualized wellness protocols. So that may include um, increased activity, increased exercise, um, chiropractic, acupuncture, um, various levels of um, hoof trimming, just to, it's like going to the podiatrist or getting better shoes, um, uh, and also some analgesic, but not so much the analgesic. And I think I think the interesting part is with those multimodal um, changes in care, they were able to Im make improvements from a minus four and change to a minus 1.6. Um, and the interesting part is moving from 2022 to 2023, the major change there was environment. Um, and in this instance, because we're talking about um, bulls, um, they got a new barn. Um, so what that included was uh, better ventilation, windows, different lighting, and a different architecture for the barn allowing for a deeper bedding so they had better footing, um, more cushioning, um, and I'm sure that involved uh, if you're standing all day on your feet, right? You'd like a cork floor versus a tile floor. Um, and ultimately, we made it into the positives. Um, so it's just an interesting look at time um, and taking a multimodal care um, and the level of improvement that we see and then adding in environmental changes and the level of change that we see. Um, so I'll leave it at that, um, but I think that we have a very unique and important opportunity to work together. Um, I come from the boring place of uh, afferent, efferent signaling squiggly lines and put some data um, next to it. But pain trace is objective. It allows us to take a single data point, which is a biomarker, um, and get a very important piece of information. As an outcome measure, where did you start before the treatment? And where do you end after the treatment? 
and individually, how did that affect you? Because we do then have the chance to move to value-based care. We do have the opportunity to pre be preventative. We do have the opportunity to treat the individual and maybe go to a no-pain-free or no-pain, excuse me, future um, and really make an impact on healthcare. And so that's why I was so glad um, that the three of us were able to be on this uh, panel because I think there's a lot of opportunity here. Um, so I'll stop. Deb, thanks for that. And uh, I think as we talk, and there's more opportunity to catch up with you, I think afterwards to talk about this novel technology. But I want to turn to Evie. Uh, I know you don't have any slides prepared. But wanted to just pick your brain about this world of longevity and its connection, just overall from your perspective. You're an oncologist, you deal with cancer pain. Um, the premise is, is that is that getting living longer may not be always the best thing. Maybe give us some perspective on that. Sure, and thank you so much again for having me on the panel. It's a great pleasure. There will be some slides later on today in my speech, and happy to, you know, um, elaborate a little bit more also on the influence of pain on the quality of life, and then from there the quality of life influencing the health span. So the life, um, the, the the years in life lived in good health, and working on the crossroads between oncology. Um, also with terminal patients, and then with uh, patients in longevity, where, where we are going from from healthy to optimal, right? They do not have problems, but a lot of them will have um, and do have. So, um, you know, I have a lot of patients uh, with knee pain, a lot of patients even with some more severe spine injuries, and they turn to longevity to look for options just as those, just you know, innovative AI using precision medicine solutions, but also to avoid the more radical um, approaches such as spondylolisthesis and so on. And living longer um, has been possible for a long while right now. We can, we can make a person live quite a long time in ICU on machines. This is not a problem. Um, worked in the ICU for many years, so um, definitely know that this does not always go along quality of life or the health span. And we still don't know, um, especially when we make a person live longer, um, in how much pain that person is, right? So we were talking about before that we have a lot of patients where they cannot communicate um, about their pain. And um, this is extreme example of coma patients, but let's say we have a you know, potentially healthy patient, but with Asperger's syndrome in adult live, and they cannot really also even assess on a scale um, subjectively their pain. So such a measurement, you know, um, from, from electrode signals is a fantastic way to map it and to measure it, and allows us also to be much more individualized in the approach of a personal health span. And this is basically what longevity medicine is trying to do. Yeah, and thank you for that. I know you have a, a talk prepared for later this morning, which is we're all uh, looking forward to. Mark, how are we doing on time? You know, I actually think we're we're through. <laughs> um, we um, can. I think we have time probably for one more question. Our, I mean, our, our producer in the back has just told us to wrap up. Oh, oh, we have five. Five minutes. Huh? Five minutes. Okay, great. Thanks for that gift. Yeah. So, um, but I think that. Um, you know, in reviewing kind of the discussion today and really going off your point, uh, Evie, about objective measures of pain. Deb, you know, I know your world started out in the world of animals, right? We used to, it was in the veterinary world. Do you want to talk about that history briefly? Uh, yeah, so. The ultimate uh, sure. uh, form of life that doesn't <laughs> we, speak to we, you. We started out in human uh, and took some correlations and then we went uh, to the ultimate nonverbal patient. Um, and. Uh, Thank you for you know just referring to the fact that a lot of individuals that are human as well are not able to verbalize their pain, um, and uh, we worked with uh, we've worked with um, eight eight mammals, um, so eight species right now, um, and we span um, companion health. Uh, so we work with veterinarians directly and helping uh, puppies and kittens, um, but we also work with industry um, and pharmaceutical companies. And I think um, the advantage of being able to work in t um, multiple species and, and particularly two different fields, animal health and human health, is the, um, the correlations that you can drive and also the access. Um, in many ways, we can move a little bit faster in animal health. We, we've been able to gain access to multiple 
types of pain and different disease states uh, very quickly. Um, and then additionally, we can translate that um, across the human health factors. And then at the same time, where there's so much more research being done in human health, we can translate that backwards to animal health. Um, so the progression's been interesting. Uh, yeah. yeah. Well, when you combine the, the option of really the spectrum that we just talked about, the idea of being able to identify early through precision medicine whether people are going to be uh, accepting of a certain treatment, and then you expose the world to say to determining whether or not patient who reports pain are really objectively in pain, and then expand that even further to those who can't communicate, particularly at the end of life, right, in the ICU. We hope that they're not in pain when they're in the ICU, but we just don't know. Uh, and then moving to the world where we actually understand that, and then, I think that this is the next place for your technology, determining whether the treatment actually had the positive effect. Because imagine a world, folks, where we would give a particular treatment for pain, and you can actually watch it physically work and have an objective measure for that. So, Evie, does that change the way you look at the future as well when it comes to some of these things? Absolutely. You know, you touch on so many important points. So I think uh, pharmacogenomics will be the next important thing also in pain management. Really, longevity medicine is about mitigating the risks of a specific disease syndrome or condition that includes pain. So knowing that the person is more perceptive to pain and not dismissing him as a phantom uh, no, or, or as a simulant will have a major impact on how we deal with patients in the sick care um, setting, but also as you mentioned, objectively measuring pain will also help us really to maybe better adjust the biofeedback base or other intervention based for those people who have phantom pain. Mm -hmm. So we were talking about veterans and soldiers. I think that's a very important group, uh, but not only those, right? Anybody who had amputation, and we have so many diabetic patients undergoing that. So it's being very much um, uh, not looked at. And I think that is really the future. So being able to objectively measure the pain, the response uh, to treatments, and also to help the patient really to biofeedback mm -hmm. is something that, um, that will help us to really guide the therapies. Can I oh, just yes. add on real quick? So regarding veterans, too, uh, uh, PTSD plays a very large role in their pain experience. And we've been working with EMDR more recently, which is eye movement uh, therapy. That's a, a whole other realm, which is the neuromodulation aspect of, of pain. There's so many opportunities, yeah. Yeah, and Dr. Bishop, I, you joined us uh, today from China, and uh, I think context matters. What can you tell us about uh, China's approach to longevity? How, how does it differ from the United States and from Europe and, and in bitter and in other ways? Well, with great pleasure. So China is definitely one of those places where Almost nothing is impossible in terms of biotech and innovation. They are extremely um, well prepared to optimize things very quickly. So everything is going digital. There are 400 plus internet hospitals, meaning hospital buildings run by AI only, zero humans and so on. Um, but in terms of longevity medicine, I think what is very much visible there is uh, the contrast, because on the one hand, you have the top AI implementation and biotech, robotics, AI labs um, in, in the clinic, and a very good network of collaboration with um, industry as well. And at the same time, the, the mindset of people, especially in the older generation, is to grasp those aspects of medicine that are very much based on lifestyle and m lifestyle modification. So what we are seeing happening is those older people, um, you know, being awake at 5 a.m., going for their exercises in the morning, and then, you know, evening the same, 5 p.m. is the last dinner. So by the sense, they already do intermittent fasting, and they do a lot of exercise and so on. We do not see many osteoporosis, for example, in China. Um, but what they are doing now, they are, like, increasing and, and optimizing it by tracking. Monitoring and tracking is very popular in China. You will see, you know, people 80 plus with CGM just because they want to know. And so that's, um, that's what's happening there. Excellent. Deb, Mike, any final thoughts? Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I think we're out of time, but I enjoyed this uh, conversation, Mark. Thanks for having this panel, and thanks, everybody, for your attention. And thank, thank you, Dr. Michael Zook, Henry Bishop, and Deb Dellen. Thanks, everyone.